Okay, hello and welcome everyone. In this video, I'm gonna talk about asymmetric information, in particular about adverse selection, following actually relatively closely to Varian uh, Intermediate Micro. All right, so asymmetric information basically refers to a situation where you've got different parties from the transaction having different levels of information about some underlying important parameter. So it could be about the quality of whatever is the good that's actually under consideration. Or in the, in the case of like the labor market, it could be different information about the underlying skill level of the employee. Presumably the worker themselves has a better sense of their underlying ability. Or in the case of, uh, in the case of financial markets, the inherent riskiness of a particular borrower. Pre presumably the borrower has a better insight into whether or not they're likely to be able to repay the loan than the lender. Well, anyway, so asymmetric information occurs in a lot of different situations. What I'll, what I'll, what I'll develop here follows Varian following George Akerlof's paper from 1970. This is the Akerlof had won the Nobel Prize uh, or the economics version of the Nobel Prize, largely for um, contributions uh, from this developing from this work. All right, so suppose we have 100 people who are selling used cars and 100 who want to buy used cars. So this is going to be our setup for the model. Suppose everyone knows that 50 cars are bad and 50 cars are good. So Varian will in common in the U.S. to refer to bad cars as lemons. There's lemon laws prevent or protecting buyers from having purchased bad cars, although this isn't, I guess now this is sort of like terminology more from the uh, 1980s. So I remember this growing up, people talking about lemons. I haven't heard people talk about cars as lemons for a really long time. But anyway, so bad cars are lemons, good cars. Well, lemons are sour, plums are sweet. Let's call good cars plums. Henceforth, I don't know. I think maybe I'll stick, I'll go back and forth between like bad cars and good cars. But uh, following Varian, we have lemons and plums. We'll assume to build in the asymmetric information, only the current owner themselves knows the underlying quality of the vehicle. So they know if they have a bad car or a good car, the buyer doesn't. Now we need some valuations and some willingness to pay, willingness to accept for our potential traders. So we'll say the owner of a lemon will accept $1,000 for the trade. The buyer will pay uh, $1,200 for it. So there are gains from trade. Those who end up buying a bad car are willing to pay more for that bad car than the sellers requiring to, to get it. Same thing with plums, with good cars. Those who are selling good cars would accept $2,000 for the trade and buyers of good cars would pay $2,400 for it. I don't know. I mean, if those are the true prices, good and bad cars are really relative because I don't know that you're going to get that great of a vehicle for even $2,400 in the U.S. at the present time. But anyway, uh, if quality is verifiable, the market functions just fine. Here's what will happen. We'd expect the price is going gonna, is gonna to equilibrate somewhere between... 1,000 and 1,200 for bad cars and somewhere between 2,000 and 2,400 for good cars. Uh, we can't say specifically if the price is going to be 1,000 or 1,200 or if it's going to be 2,000 or 2,400 or anywhere in between where the price would actually land if everybody's able to verify the quality would be determined by the relative buying power, bargaining power of our buyer and seller. So if the sellers have more bargaining power, we'd expect higher prices. If the buyers have more bargaining power, we'd expect lower prices. All we can say, if everybody's aware of the quality, is that the market's gonna work, all the cars are gonna trade, and the price for bad cars is somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200, for good cars, somewhere between 2,000 and 2,400. All right, so I'm going to continue developing this model. I'll develop the theory, and then at the end, I'll go over some examples that are similar to exercises that, uh, that reinforce the content. All right, so what if it's the case, though, that qualify, or quality is unobservable? So we said if we are able to verify the quality, things work well. What if not? Well, if the buyer has to guess, if the, if the buyer is unable to observe the quality but knows something about the relative proportion of the good cars, that's our assumption here. They have some understanding of the distribution. Maybe this is based on past experience or anecdotal evidence, but they have some belief, some, some subjective probability of the likelihood of drawing a good car versus a bad car. So the buyer is able to form a guess, the expected value of a randomly selected car. If they believe half, half the cars to be bad, and half the cars to be good, then the value of a randomly selected car to that buyer is going to be one half times their valuation for a bad car plus one half times their valuation for a good car. In this example, it's going to be 1800, right? 600 plus 1200 is 1800. And then the question is, if this is my expected value for a randomly selected car, who's going to be willing to sell? 
for a car at 1800 Well, the owner of a lemon will accept 1000 so they're going to be pretty thrilled about that. What about the owner of a plum? No. They are only willing to pay, they're only willing to part with their car if the, if the buyer is paying at least $2,000. So the problem is the owner of the lemon, they're willing to sell their car at this, at the, that the price that the consumer is willing to pay, but the sellers of good cars are not. So the price the buyers will pay for the average car being less than the sellers that the buy, that the sellers would accept for good cars means that only the lemons, only the bad cars are going to be for sale. The problem is if we can figure this out, presumably the buyer is going to be able to figure this out either from talking to other people or from past experience and, you know, realizing, oh, only the bad cars are available for sale. And that's a problem because if the buyer knows for certain the car must be bad, they're not going to be willing to pay $1,800 for it. They're only going to be willing to pay up to $1,200 for it. So now we expect, as a result, the mere presence of bad cars has destroyed the market for good cars because the expected value that buyers hold for a randomly selected car is less than sellers would accept for a good car. So now all the cars are bad. So now the price of cars is going to be between 1000 and 1200 and no good cars are going to sell. Only 50 cars, only the 50 bad cars will sell. So here's the, here's the summary of what I just now said. With only lemons for sale, buyers correctly expect to get lemons when the buyer would be willing to pay more for plums than sellers would require as compensation because buyers were willing to pay 2,400, sellers were requiring 2,000 for their plum, no trades actually take place, right? Buyers were willing to pay 2,400 for a good car, sellers would accept it 2,000. There were gains from trade and there still are gains for trade that could be exploited, but this isn't happening because buyers are not expecting that they're gonna be getting good cars and since they're not believing that they're getting good cars. They're not willing to pay enough to incentivize sellers of good cars to actually participate in the market. And what's happening here is there's this negative externality that's being exerted by sellers of bad cars on sellers of good cars. Each additional bad car that enters the market contaminates the willingness to pay the expectation of buyers for a randomly selected car and makes it less likely that that ultimately good cars will be able to sell as the willingness to pay falls. And so the comment here, this lowers the willingness to pay and hurts sellers of good cars. And it's this externality that creates market failure. The situation we described where the equilibrium price is between 1,000 and 1,200 and only the, good car, only the bad cars sell, no good cars sell, is exactly market failure. This is when the market fails to deliver the efficient outcome and fully exploit the possible gains from trade. All right, so here's another, here's another follow-up. Suppose the producers are determining the quality. What will be the equilibrium quality in the market? So suppose we have a, a seller who can determine, who can sell um, an umbrella, and there's two different qualities of umbrellas that are available to, sale, to sell. Suppose the high-quality umbrellas are valued by consumers for $14, low-quality umbrellas are valued by consumers for $8, and assume the quality of the umbrella is unobservable in the store. You just go in, you buy an umbrella. If it works out for you, then good. If not, then you get wet. And I had that example. I had a bad umbrella when I lived in Pittsburgh, which is bad because Pittsburgh's a super rainy city. You wouldn't think that, but it's actually not... Anecdotally, I've never verified this. It's not supposed to be very far behind Seattle in terms of precipitation. Anyway, it seemed like it rained virtually every day and I had this umbrella with a little hole in it and I keep getting wet. Um, anyway, so, so bad umbrellas do exist. <laughs> Some manufacturers make high quality umbrellas, other make low quality umbrellas. And let's assume, so here's the setup, sorry. So consumers are willing to pay 1400 for a good quality, or it's 1400, $14 for a good quality, $8 for a bad quality. We assume both qualities cost $11.50 to make and some manufacturers can make high quality, others make low quality. Now in a perfectly competitive industry, what's the equilibrium quality we might expect? Well, there's actually three things that can happen. So what's happening at, at what our starting point is, is realizing consumers are judging the quality by the average quality sold. And so we can represent the fraction of high quality umbrellas by Q. So then their willingness to pay is going to be P is equal to 14, which is my willingness to pay for a good quality umbrella times the fraction of good quality umbrellas, plus my willingness to pay for bad quality umbrella times the fraction of bad quality umbrellas. And so this is going to be the randomly, the, of a, the willingness to pay for a randomly selected umbrella is just going to be this sum. Right. And like I said, there's three cases. So the first thing that can happen is maybe only low quality umbrellas are in the market. In this case, nothing actually sells. Right. Because if low quality umbrellas are in the market, uh, consumers are only willing to pay eight dollars. The marginal cost was eleven fifty. There's actually no gains from trade. And so there's no reason to produce or sell umbrellas at this point. 
Uh, suppose only high quality umbrellas were in the market. Well, that would be good for consumers, right? Consu uh, the producers would compete down the price to a marginal cost of eleven fifty from consumers' willingness to pay for good quality umbrellas of fourteen dollars. We compete down the price to eleven fifty. Consumers' willingness to pay is fourteen hundred, so there'd be consumer surplus existing between the price of fourteen dollars and the uh, sorry the, between their willingness to pay of fourteen dollars and the price of eleven fifty when price equals marginal cost. And the third thing that could happen is both qualities could be present in the market. So we might expect competitive forces will push the price down to this 1150 we found before. And now, realizing this, we can exploit the fact that the average quality available must have a value equal to 1150. It doesn't need to be for the market to work. It doesn't actually need to be all the umbrellas are high quality. It just needs to be that the average quality is 1150. So let's take a look at this. If both qualities exist and the competitive forces drive the, for the price down to 1150, which was marginal cost, the average quality must be equal to 1150. Well, remember our fraction of high quality umbrellas was Q. My willingness to pay for a randomly selected umbrella was 14 Q plus eight times uh, one minus Q. So this is my willingness to pay my willingness to pay for good quality umbrellas times the fraction of good quality umbrella. My willingness to pay for bad quality umbrella times the fraction of bad quality umbrella. And this has to be greater than or equal to 1150 for the market to work. And if you solve this out, you'll find the fraction Q, the proportion of good quality umbrellas, has to be 7 twelfths. It's just an algebraic ex exercise. And if 7 twelfths of the suppliers are offering high quality, the consumers will be willing to pay exactly 1150 for an umbrella. And if more than 7 twelfths of the umbrellas are good quality, consumers would be willing to pay more. Ultimately, we'd expect the price still gets computed down or competed down to 1150, and then there's some consumer surplus. So my comment: consumer prefers equilibria with more high-quality sellers, but to get the market to work, we just need at least seven twelfths of the umbrellas to be high quality. All right. So, whoops. So suppose now each producer is choosing their own quality. So assume the quality to make high quality umbrellas is 1150, and now to give a reason to make low quality umbrellas, suppose the the cost to make low quality is 11. By Q, we still mean the fraction of umbrellas that are high quality. It's got to be somewhere between 0 and 1. So let's examine the behavior and the incentives facing one producer when they're deciding whether to produce high quality umbrellas for 1150 or low quality umbrellas for 11. And the problem is, we're assuming our, our suppliers are going to be both price takers, the price is going to be 11 or, or competed down to marginal cost, and a quality taker, the quality is going to get competed down to low quality. So we assume they ultimately, at the individual level, only want to produce low quality umbrellas. And what's going to happen is, each individual firm that contributes an umbrella is going to neglect the impact of that quality choice on consumers' expected value for a randomly selected umbrella. And so when you produce one more low quality umbrella, they're not paying attention to this negative externality exerted on the market as a whole. Instead, what they're going to focus on is they're going to focus on choosing the most profitable, profitable product for themselves, which is the low quality umbrella, which is uh, 50 cents cheaper to make. The problem is, if, we, if we're reasoning like this, so is every other producer. So we're expecting only low quality umbrellas are ultimately going to be produced. The problem is consumers only value low quality umbrellas at $8, but those eight, those low quality umbrellas cost $11 to make. And so the problem is in this equilibrium, there would be no umbrellas. The problem is in this situation, now the very possibility of low quality umbrellas existing would destroy the market for both types. And I suppose now people are just going to run around with magazines or newspapers in their head whenever it, whenever it rains, because they're not going to, I don't know, they're not going to want to buy these bad umbrellas. So. Anyway, this is, this is interesting. In the first case, we had, in the cars example, we have a situation where the, the very presence of bad quality cars destroys the market for good quality cars. That's the market failure. In this umbrellas example, where the, where the firms are choosing their quality, now we've got a situation where the possibility of low quality umbrellas is destroying both markets, actually. So that's, a, that's kind of a really big problem. And so I won't follow up with this here, but you can think about the things the sellers would try to do in terms of guarantees or warranties or other sorts of third party verification to try to reinforce and to infuse some confidence into the minds of consumers. And after the lecture, it's interesting thinking about those things relative to trying to restore market power. So in, in the present day, so we have the examples of like TrueCar or Carfax, Carfax to try to restore some of the information imbalance. 
All right, so at this point, I want to go over a couple of worked examples. I've got two. So suppose high quality and low quality, suppose there's high quality and low quality used widgets. Consumers value the high quality at 40 or $400, low quality at $100. And now I've got supply functions. Suppose the supply of widgets for high quality is going to be price minus 100. And suppose the supply of low quality widgets is going to be two times the price minus 50 for high and low quality widgets, respectively. Here's going to be the five things we're going to do. First, assume buyers can't tell quality ex ante. I don't know if you're shopping online, you can't tell the difference of, between quality. I've had some bad experiences on Amazon of late. Uh, if buyers believe there's a 50% chance of selecting a low quality widget at random, what price will they pay for any widget in this market? Right. So this is giving us a distribution of good car, or good widgets and bad widgets. And this will allow us to determine the expected valuation. If the price from A is actually offered, how many high and low quality widgets are up for sale? Well, we need to use our supply functions to do that. Then determine what percentage in B, this is B, are actually low quality. Um, oops, maybe that was this. And then what do we expect is going to happen over time is information about the true population of good and bad widgets reaches consumers, maybe through product reviews. All right, so you can pause the video, kind of work on this exercise for a second. I've got the solution on the very next slide. Wait a couple of beats and then go to it. All right, so if buyers are believing there's a 50% chance of selecting a low quality widget at random, their expected value is gonna be just the fraction of bad, of good widgets times their willingness to pay for good widgets, plus the fraction of their belief, the expected fraction, their subjective probability, the fraction of bad widgets times their, belief, their willingness to pay for a bad widget. And this will come out to an expected valuation of $250, telling us that the consumer would be willing to pay $250 for a randomly selected widget. Now, if that's the case, if that's going to be the price, right, if this is how much I'm willing to pay for a random widget, that becomes the price that buyers are willing to pay. That's what we have to compare to our supply curves, right? So at the price of 250, how much are buyers going to, how much are suppliers going to bring to the market? Well, 250 minus 100 is going to be 150 high quality widgets. 250 times two is gonna be 500 minus 50 is going to be 450 low quality widgets. Here, I don't know if I, maybe I shouldn't have had these subscripts because this price is just gonna be 250 in both cases. Here, I'm just using my supply curves. I find 150 bad widgets, 450 good widgets. Oh, wait a second. This expected value of 250 was predicated on this belief that 50% 50, 50 of them are good. So that creates kind of a massive problem. Hence, what's the percentage that are actually low quality? Well, high quality was 150, low quality was 450, so the true fraction of low quality is actually 75%. The true fraction of good quality is actually only 25%. The problem is high quality sellers are gonna be relatively hesitant to enter the market because of the low willingness to pay, the low expected valuation of $250. Low quality sellers are much more interested in selling. So we get a lot more low quality widgets, which actually drives down the fraction of high quality widgets, which drives down the willingness to pay of consumers. This is exactly adverse selection. When there's stronger incentives for the low quality type than for the high type, we have adverse selection. The market is providing the bad type, right? Adverse selection, you're more like there's a preponderance of whatever is the bad quality rising to the surface in this market. All right, so what do we expect is gonna happen over time as information about the true population reaches consumers, maybe through product reviews or whatever? Well, we're expecting consumers' ex expectation, their expected valuation to drive down, to fall. We'd have to redo this calculation now with uh, 0.25 and 0.75 and you get a much lower expected value, right? And so what's gonna happen is over time, high quality sellers have a tendency to leave the market. This further accentuates the effect and ultimately only the low quality widgets are gonna exist in the market, which will drive down willingness to pay even further. So that's kind of a problem and this leads us to our market failure example again. again. All right, so another example, suppose there's two distinct markets for widgets in Arlington, Nebraska. Arlington, Nebraska has like 2000 people. They're voted by Bloomberg Business Week as being the second best place in the country to raise children. They don't have an ice cream store. They used to have a Dairy King and went out of business. Arlington cannot possibly be the second best place in the country to raise children, right? Like it's a good place, it's a fine place. It's maybe 40 minutes outside of Omaha, which is a wonderful city, but there's no possible way that the city of like 2000 people or a thousand people without an ice cream store is the second best place in the country to raise children. So what's the, what's the moral of that story talking about Arlington, Nebraska? It's a wonderful place, I love this little place. However, 
what's happened is you've got this you've got this sort of like obnoxiously skewed rating system. So anytime you see a ranking, anytime you see a ranking that talks about like what's the best healthcare system, what's the best school, all these sorts of things, remember there's different there's different weights attributed or given to each different uh, attribute. And so you always kind of want to read between the lines and um, and especially if you get some surprising result. Anyway, so in this example, buyers are valuing a high quality widget at $12,000, a low quality widget at $8,000. There's 200 widgets in the market, half of high quality, right? So 50-50. Sellers want $5,000 for low quality widgets, $11,000 for high quality widgets. So if we assume perfect information, how many low and high quality widgets sell? Uh, suppose quality is only known to the seller. This is like the setup of the cars problem. What would be the price if buyers correctly infer the proportion of low quality widgets to be 50%? How many high quality widgets are actually going to be for sale here? After sellers respond to the market conditions, what's the equilibrium price and proportion of quality for high quality widgets? And then what if the high quality widget sellers are now willing to accept 9,500 rather than 1,100? What if we lower this down to 9,500? How's that affect things? All right, so I'll pause for a second. You can work through the example. We'll think about it. So if we assume perfect information, how many low and high quality widgets sell? Well, they all sell for prices between these willingness to pay, right? Assuming perfect information, how many low and high quality widgets sell? All 200 sell. The price of high quality will be somewhere between the willingness to accept for sellers, willingness to pay for buyers, and the willingness to accept for low quality uh, sellers of widgets, and the willingness to pay for low quality buyers of widgets. This right here, this is just the price of high quality. This symbol right here just means is contained in this set. And this is this end, this uh, close bracket is saying that the price could actually be 11 thousand or the price could be twelve thousand or anywhere in between we don't know which the price is going to be without knowing further information about the relative bargaining power of buyers and sellers of widgets now suppose quality is known only to the seller what will be the price if buyers correctly infer the, the proportion of low quality widgets to be 50 percent so 100 are good 100 are bad well this is just going to be our expected valuation calculation so it's going to be 12,000 times a half so 6,000 plus 8,000 times a half so 4,000 gives us 6,000 plus 4,000 is 10,000 is the willingness to pay for a randomly selected widget. That tells us the market price is going to be $10,000. That's the most a consumer is going to be willing to pay if they believe only 50% are good. How many high quality widgets are available for sale at this price? Oh, we have a problem. The willingness to accept for sellers, the lowest that they're willing to accept was $11,000, but that's bigger than the price, the willingness to pay for buyers of a randomly selected widget. So when buyers are unable to verify the quality of the widget they're buying, sellers of high quality widgets are not willing to be, are, are not willing to participate, right? So there is no high quality widgets available which further reinforces our market dynamics that's gonna drive down the prices, right? After sellers respond, there's gonna be no good quality widgets. This is the market failure. There's only gonna be bad quality widgets for sale. And the price of low quality widgets will be somewhere between 5,000 and 8,000, right? And then the last part, what if high quality widget sellers are willing to accept something more? What if they're willing to accept 9,500 rather than 11,000? Well, we wanna think about what changes. With perfect information, the result from part A wouldn't change if the willingness to accept was 9,500. I mean, it would change a little bit, but not in terms of like the number of, not in terms of the number of widgets selling. What would change is this lower bound would become 9,500, but we'd still get all 100 good widgets selling, right? Uh, with perfect information, so that was this part. For B, the expected value remains at $10,000. Buyer's valuation wasn't affected. This is sellers who are willing to accept something different. So this calculation is still going to be the same, still willing to pay 12,000, still willing to pay 8,000 for high and low quality respectively. What does change? Well, the willingness, willingness to accept for high quality widgets has fallen. So now all 100 widgets that are high quality are actually offered at this price of the randomly, the price of a, a willingness to pay, the price of a randomly selected widget is actually now above the are above the willingness to accept of high quality uh, sellers of high quality widgets. So what happens is now this new equilibrium does involve all widgets trading at this price of $10,000, which further reinforces something. This is kind of a big overarching point, which is that this imbalance of information need not but may often create market failure or may often but need not create market failure. Here's a situation where if the willingness to accept of high quality of sellers of high quality widgets is low enough, 
even if buyers don't observe the quality, they're still able to go ahead and make the purchase. Matter of fact, that's pretty much how we live our lives. A lot of cases, you're not able to perfectly observe quality. In a lot of markets, it doesn't create a problem. Where does it create a problem? Well, if the sellers of buyers is above the willingness to accept for a randomly selected widget or item or whatever. It's in those circumstances where the proportion of higher low quality widgets in actuality does have an, uh, an impact on the market. And so that's interesting kind of tying together each of these exercises, thinking about when the asymmetric information matters and creates market failure and when it doesn't. And it's especially interesting from the standpoint of policymakers in a given market, thinking about how to rectify the situation, be it like a healthcare, health insurance market, car market, car insurance market, financial markets, or whatever is the case. It's a lot of interesting things here. All right, so I'll go ahead and conclude here. I hope you liked the video and then uh, see you next time.